Okay, uh, let's start uh, the continuation. So we have been discussing about the light quarks. Uh, the light quarks constitute of three quarks, which are uh, so. Uh, so we were discussing about uh, the light quarks and the formation of the bound states with those light quarks. So the light quarks uh, typically consist of three quarks which are U, D and S. Both uh, U of the has uh, electric charge of 2 by 3 d has minus 1 by 3 and s has minus 1 by 3 strangeness both up and down quark do not have any strangeness whereas the strange quark contains uh, uh, the strange uh, strangeness of uh, minus 1 or plus 1 it's a matter of convention okay uh, this is what uh, we have so with this they form bound states the mesons are essentially uh, meson states are uh, bound states of Q, Q bar bound states, whereas the baryons are bound states of Q, Q, Q type. All of them are colorless, all of them are colorless. So, in the sense that they are, uh, um, they, they, the color quantum number is sort of hidden from any of the physical states. Now the light quarks are, uh, so we have to deal with these bound states in nature. So how do I deal, so the way, uh, how do I deal with these uh, bound states? Now remember we started with uh, the construction of uh, or the classification of all the mesons and baryons started with the flavor symmetry. Symmetry, which is called SU3. Okay, now which is the SU3 flavor symmetry where the triplet is essentially UDS and anti triplet is U bar D bar and S bar. Uh, the color uh, the color symmetry is another symmetry of SU3 with three colors, but we will come to that in later action. So at low energies, uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, uh, the quarks don't really are not free particles. They combine and form bound states and the physical states are essentially these bound states and one has to deal with them. How do you deal with bound states? or composite states in quantum field theory. How do you understand their interactions? How do these bond states form? So this is not uh, an easy topic, but it is guided by um, uh, symmetry properties okay <clears throat> properties some of them which are exact like for example uh, the symmetries which are con conserved by strong interactions are essentially the Lorentz symmetry Uh, flavor symmetries not all all of okay say for example str uh, strangeness say for example is conserved sort of in the, is sort of conserved meaning when I say flavor it's not the su3 not 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 equal to su3 okay okay uh, then uh, parity 
C charge conjugation. So all the symmetries are conserved um, by the strong interaction. So whenever we are trying to understand uh, strong interactions, these things guide us essentially. Strangeness is conserved, so on, so essentially. We know. Then there are approximate symmetries. These are sort of exact symmetries. All of them are global symmetries. So then there are these approximate symmetries. Which are SU3 flavor or SU2 flavor. Meaning essentially if you are dealing with systems which are just uh, which do not have any um, strangeness say for example okay so this is almost like the isospin symmetry in terms of the hadrons okay in terms of the neutron proton system this is like the isospin symmetry and this is the su2 flavor symmetry of the uds so uh, the isospin symmetry is for systems which are baryons and mesons which don't really care about any strange quarks in their system like for example uh, uh, not the k mesons but pions essentially if you are just dealing with pions you don't really care about the strange quark now this uh, the flavor symmetry um, symmetry or the symmetry which i call the c3 symmetry is uh, badly broken uh, okay we know that uh, uh, the masses are sort of uh, uh, so is it's not uh, broken uh, is badly broken in the sense that it's not exact but um, it's badly broken means there are uh, the mass difference between strange quark and mud is pretty large is uh, very large okay um, actually the strange uh, quark is uh, quite uh, many pretty heavy compared to the uh, mass of the up and down quarks because to measure up and down quarks is also extremely difficult but whatever estimates we get from the calculations okay we can see that the strange quark mass is uh, actually uh, pretty heavy compared to up and down quarks say for example for certain masses regions essentially strange quark could be uh, about 90 mev whereas up and down quarks are around 10 to 20 mev in uh, certain regions of mass so 20 to 30 mev so it uh, ms could be around a factor 3 times md ms so this also already tells you that ms is the dominant it's a, so this is really order one okay it's order one so it's not it's not a small number essentially this is an order one but still but still su3 is a pretty good uh, symmetry uh, to understand <coughs> this uh, the composition of mesons composition and classification of mesons and baryons composition and classification of mesons Now, uh, okay. <coughs> now, what about say uh, interactions? Say, for example, uh, what about interactions? Now, 
now normally we assume um, we assume the states in the s matrix Uh, which are essentially the um, say the in and out states to be fundamental okay they are supposed to be uh, these are fundamental quantities uh, uh, so what you would expect is uh, Uh, meaning so uh, so you don't use them uh, so these states are essentially you can uh, meaning the, the, that means they are uh, elementary states they are the, they can be expanded into momentum states as con in quantum field theory can be extra uh, okay and then you can give uh, uh, <coughs> uh, so can be expanded in terms so of you know harmonic oscillator momentum states right fox states and then uh, different uh, momentum states you can take them and then do the calculations now if there is a one state or two state uh, like in qd okay now what happens in the case of um, bound state so suppose if pi on so let's take the uh, situation with pi on neutron scattering so consider pi n scattering now uh, we derived some uh, some sort of you know uh, some sort of uh, equivalence relations between pi n scattering and pi p scattering you no know? Uh, we derived using symmetry arguments uh, first certain modes uh, using uh, <coughs> amplitude sorry here it is amplitudes um, using the the isospin symmetry okay now the question is how about actually calculating these amplitudes so how do we treat them essentially how about about actually calculating these amplitudes so to calculate the amplitudes however we have to use some other uh, aspect because as I said we cannot use the um, uh, the constant quarks so constant quarks quark fields are not actually physical okay so how do you do that so so the way you do that is by invoking uh, something called form factors okay <coughs> the form factors uh, will take care of uh, the form okay uh, the form physical so instead one uses the bound states of mesons and baryons
okay now uh, how does uh, so then so this is taken uh, use the bounce rate so instead of that so one uses something called uh, the technique one uses is something called the form factors factors so the see, see these are essentially um, um, the the uh, this is parameterize the unknown uh, factors associated with how quarks are um, distributed inside a uh, so, sort of distributed or uh, uh, distributed let me look for the lack of better word let me just say for a lack of simpler word I'll just use uh, uh, distributed inside a meson meson okay say for example the form factor uh, so with a pi on there will be several form factors associated whether it will be in, uh, depending upon the interaction involved upon the interaction involved involved whether it is electromagnetic um, electromagnetic or weak or uh, anything else so other interactions say for example uh, so the the form factors would be different Okay, so so these form factors are essentially things which take care of, uh, uh, let's say, what, what we don't know about uh, the unknown knowledge about how the quarks are distributed inside a pion. Now we still uh, to understand more details about how the pion structure is and. Uh, Uh, so one uses various techniques at this stage. The two main broad theories or techniques one uses uh, come under uh, two different theories. These form factors first of all are determined by experiment. Now, uh, at the fundamental, at the theoretical level, uh, you need uh, uh, some, uh, you say, what do you call uh, uh, first principles theory, but which you don't have actually. So, there are two main uh, theories which are competing at these scales with light quarks. Theories used below lambda QCD or, or uh, below or around uh, scales of lambda QCD where uh, there are these uh, uh, these mesons mesons baryons all made up of light quarks which are essentially u d and s
So, uh, so this uh, several form factors. Uh, okay, so uh, to at the fundamental level, there are two theories. These two theories go under the mind chiral perturbation theory. And the second theory is called lattice gauge theory. Chiral perturbation theory, uh, uh, which started as an extension extension to current algebra what I'll just tell you what is current algebra okay uh, started off by Adler and then Weinberg and then Leutwiller Gasser okay so all these people were really important in developing this theory actually so this theory, I'll just tell a couple of slides on this theory and a few minutes on this theory. This theory starts off with the um, idea that uh, what could be the possible approximately conserved current. Conserved neither currents. So the, uh, the essential point here is that if you have a conserved uh, symmetry, say for example, let's just take a C2 symmetry, global, then there is a approximate, uh, okay, for, forget about the approximate part essentially, there is a, uh, say there is a corresponding uh, algebra associated with the, uh, uh, the generators of the group, say for example, you have tau A, tau b is equal to i epsilon a b c tau c okay you will have uh, such a um, uh, algebra associated with this thing now if there is a lagrangian l is equal to l0 plus l1 say for example l1 is the symmetry breaking part Lagrangian and this is symmetry conserving Lagrangian because we know that this is approximately um, uh, Lagrangian. So, if we have a flavor symmetry, say for example, L0 could contain all the kinetic terms and stuff like that, whereas L1 will contain masses, say for example, say m u u bar mu plus md dd bar and so on so which are roughly which is not exactly uh, say su2 invariant or isospin invariant or a su3 invariant in the case of su3 essentially so if you have a su3 it is ms ss bar and so on so so this could be a su2 or a su3 invariant so with this there is an associated neither current okay there is an associated neither current it turns out uh, so uh, there is an associated neither current and then there is also an associated neither charge okay there is also uh, one second why this happened what happened so these are the two main competing theories one is uh, chiral perturbation theory and uh, lattice gauge theory so as i was saying there is the first one about chiral perturbation theory is an extension of something called uh, um, uh, current algebra current algebra starts with 
the the idea that we have approximately uh, uh, conserved currents like for example the flavor symmetry currents which we have seen like for either in terms of the isospin which is the SU2 and or in terms of the SU3 essentially and the generators of those global symmetries satisfy these commutation relationships. So the current uh, current perturbation theory start uh, the current algebra was essentially uh, in fact actually it was started by uh, cyber uh, what do you call it? Schwinger, Gelman and several others actually and then there is something called the Adler um, uh, Adler sum rule and then there is a Weinberg uh, Lloyd Miller, Gasser, they all contributed in developing this carrier perturbation theory. So it started off by Schwinger actually. So anyway, there is a global symmetry as we have seen when uh, things are almost degenerate. Okay. So according to the global symmetry, you will have some, uh, the global symmetry has some generators which satisfy this um, competition relationships. Now, if we divide the Lagrangian into two parts, one is essentially the symmetry conserving part and the symmetry breaking part like we have written here. So, let L1 be the symmetry breaking part. Now, in the examples which we have seen so far like SU2 or SU3, so L0 could contain the three quark fields, the light quark fields and the kinetic terms and uh, L1 would be the symmetry breaking part and the symmetry breaking as I said is always a proportional to the difference in the masses. So the L1 would contain only the mass terms like MUU bar, MDD bar, MSS bar if it is SU3 or MUU bar, MDD bar which if it is SU2 essentially. Whereas the L0 is exactly invariant. Given that L0 is exactly invariant, uh, keeping aside the L1 part, so let us assume that L1 uh, uh, L1 is much much smaller than L0. So under this assumption, what we can do actually, you can work with uh, L0, and there is an associated Noether current with uh, in L0, so right? For uh, in a sense, because it's exactly invariant. Okay. Now current algebra rests on the fact that because there is an associated um, uh, Noether current, there is also an associated Noether charge. charge along along with these symmetries okay so these symmetries, uh, so this uh, now what is the important thing is when you put back these Noether charges in terms of the fundamental fields, say for example, the fields which are associated with uh, say pi on fields or any of these things and put it back into the, uh, into the definition of this Lagrangian, it turns out that these charges, say for example, associated charges also satisfy similar commutation, the same commutation relations as uh, as the, the uh, as the, uh, what do you call as the, uh, as the generators. So this is called the charge algebra. So this is called the charge algebra. So this you can get by uh, demanding uh, using the <coughs> okay. Uh, so this is called the charge abbreviation. Now you can re-express this entire thing in terms of some sort of. Uh, okay, one should remember this. These are something called the equal time commutation relationships. So, okay. 
and uh, and these can be re-expressed in terms of the currents themselves, the currents of the fields, uh, current in some of the fields, somewhat like essentially like uh, J A zero x t times J zero b x t is equal to i some other constant say for example uh, uh, say so some constants like c a b c j c 0 x t so this is something called current algebra so you have commutation relations in terms of this particular uh, in terms of the conserved currents or conserved charges then there are some you can actually not just the zeroth component you can write also in terms of the space components and there are some technical aspects of it the basic idea is that you use these currents uh, to actually um, uh, okay you, you you write this current you use you can also okay uh, you, you uh, these uh, the the symmetry is now represented in terms of this uh, currents essentially the symmetry is manifest the global symmetry is now manifest in terms of these currents which are made up of the uh, fields essentially which are appearing in the Lagrangian okay that is important and now you can uh, uh, express uh, these symmetry currents in terms of the physical currents actually so they can be actually the physical currents say which are appearing in some scattering process like um, so in some scattering process like say for example if you have neutrino scattering say neutrino scattering or any other okay, you can think of uh, uh, some uh, let's do a, uh, some some scattering in terms of say so neutrino scattering is interesting because it is has some some rule associated with okay, essentially a lepton and then say let's just say that uh, there is some neutron here neutron and neutrons here and this produces some bunch of x so this is some debris okay so the neutron comes in he, uh, hits the nuclear uh, neutron target and then it produces some debris and a lepton essentially now you can use this current as a, as though that it is some sort of a physical uh, current okay the symmetry currents can be used as some physical currents and you can sandwich them uh, that uh, these currents say for example in this uh, so you have associated currents in terms of say uh, 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 so the, whether it is a weak current or electromagnetic current and so on so okay you can use these currents okay and write it uh, So the symmetric currents, uh, the symmetric currents uh, J symmetry are nothing but J weak or J uh, EM. So you can actually use them for the interaction. Say for example, for the neutrino, uh, uh, any of the pion neutrino scattering, any of these things. Okay, and then you can sandwich them. Say for example, in this case, what you can do is uh, in the amplitude, you can actually sandwich it. So, for example, in this case, I'll just write down the amplitude. I won't go into the details of how you got it. Here, it is essentially because it's a neutrino. Okay. This will be given by some GF by root two. We'll see what GF is later on, essentially, and U bar, uh, some uh, momentum k times gamma, say uh, lambda, uh, say one minus gamma five. U of lambda, uh, say this is for, uh, okay, this is for the lepton, say for example, and so on, this will be the uh, uh, neutrino, yeah. 
this will be for the neutrino now this box the box of the hadron you directly write it as just a current transaction say for example neutron uh, is the in state time some hadronic current okay time some proton some momentum state essentially so these currents so the currents which we have studied in the previous section appear here essentially so you can write it as a matrix element and then after writing in terms of the matrix elements the matrix elements can be expanded in terms of lorentz uh, uh, a dictated lorentz symmetry dictated dictate dictated um, um momentum combinations and form factors so you can just uh, use this entire technology essentially uh, of this current algebra to get an uh, matrix element out of this particular uh, this part in which we actually don't know how to calculate and we expand this in terms of some uh, say uh, form factors okay in this case the form factor would be quite complicated actually because there is a, it's a tensorial form factor in the in the cross section so there will be a, several lorentz invariant form factors and moment and uh, momentum combinations like for example q p mu p alpha p beta and so on so on so on so okay So these form factors can be determined in, in by knowing the experiment essentially. So you can use all the uh, uh, so using the uh, so you can get what these Lorentz uh, invariant uh, form factors are, <laughs> and then you can get uh, uh, some relations between these things essentially. So these uh, uh, form factors will have some relations. In terms of the currents essentially again you can re-express it in terms of the currents and then you can have some I can express it in terms of currents and you can have you can have some final relations actually so this is the starting point of the current algebra so for example in terms of the current algebra solutions chiral symmetry actually goes further actually it extends okay chiral symmetry I'm spending some time on chiral symmetry uh, uh, breaking theory uh, because okay chiral symmetry chiral perturbation theory or okay let me just say starts off with this starts there but its starting current is much more uh, bigger so it starts off with a much bigger current essentially so it starts off with uh, much bigger symmetry so uh, So, the chiral perturbation theory uh, starts off with uh, a much larger symmetry uh, which is essentially SU3 left times SU3 right. So you remember uh, there are left states and right states. 
okay so there are left states and right states essentially so where su3 l are left handed currents and su3 r are, are right handed currents okay so left to su2 so this is defined by pl uh, is essentially 1 plus gamma phi by 2 and pr is 1 minus gamma phi by 2 so you make currents purely after, after uh, for the currents with left handed fermions which are essentially uds and uh, SU2 arc starts with currents with right handed fermions. So the chiral symmetry rests on the fact that the in the massless limit okay uh, so so R is in the right handed uh, fermions so the chiral symmetry uh, in the in the massless limit limit that means when mu is equal to md is equal to ms is equal to 0 it's an exact symmetry so the chiral symmetry is an exact symmetry at that limit when all the three masses are zero set to 0 now uh, but then when the uh, when uh, and it's broken it's broken by by the mass uh, the mass generation of these quarks when the quarks get masses it's actually broken but there is one more deeper thing which is associated with this symmetry is that this tells you uh, the symmetry rests on the fact that one very very important uh, fact which is called spontaneous symmetry breaking So I am going to I am spending some time on this uh, a little bit because I will use the same thing for the um, uh, uh, we will use this technology actually this uh, the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking is also very important to understand weak interactions but it was first understood in, in strong interactions uh, perhaps also even in, uh, in condensed matter theories okay in linear sigma models and stuff like that okay but the origination of spontaneous symmetry breaking um, in uh, uh, started in say in condensed matter in ferromagnetism and uh, other areas but um, in particle physics it was origin uh, the origins of spontaneous symmetry breaking understanding of it came from nambu uh, <coughs> and he understood essentially a uh, how the, uh, the symmetry is actually spontaneously broken the chiral symmetry this symmetry su3 l times su3 r which is this larger symmetry is broken to a single su3 which we call it as d let me just call it as a d okay and this diagonal breaking produces uh, produces something called goldstone bosons and and the pions which are massless in this limit are identified as this goldstone boson what are these goldstone bosons okay let me just spend a little bit time on this because this is a very very important aspect essentially so the okay the entire chiral symmetry chiral lagrangian and the entire chiral symmetry breaking and uh, a uh, chiral perturbation theory uh, is based on this uh, something called uh, uh, on this particular aspect actually so what is uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking
So well, let's try to understand with a simple model and then uh, <coughs> we'll see uh, what it is essentially. So spontaneous symmetry breaking um, is that uh, the symmetry is broken only by the vacuum state. So, okay, so the symmetry is broken only by the vacuum state. So, that means vacuum state in quantum field theory is as in anywhere in quantum mechanics everywhere is the lowest energy state. So, you could have uh, the Lagrangian is invariant under some symmetry. Okay, so let us say, say this could be SU2 or SU3 or even just a simple U1 or U1. Let us take a simple example of uh, U1, say for example, or a 7D, it could be some, uh, let us take continuous symmetry, say. Okay, we will come, okay. Okay, so the Lagrangian is invariant under some symmetry like uh, SU3 or SU2. Okay. In principle, spontaneous symmetry breaking can also work in uh, discrete case actually. Okay, um, we will come to that in a second. Uh, we will mention that, but we will uh, in the present case we are more interested in uh, continuous symmetries. Okay, we are only more interested in continuous symmetries. So, but in the vacuum state which is represented by 0, okay. Uh, uh, this is not invariant. Uh, so, if you apply vacuum uh, transition, it does not go to vacuum. Okay, The symmetry does not state does not really go into vacuum. Instead, it goes to another state which is almost degenerate. Okay, There are infinite number of degenerate states associated with the vacuum. Okay. Uh, in uh, in typical spontaneously symmetry breaking cases actually so the the uh, the symmetry transformation is not invariant on the vacuum state but every other state all the high energy states okay it is um, invariant the simplest example is consider u1 In the case of a U1, so let us write down a scalar theory phi which is charged under U1, okay, charged under okay, so uh, phi prime goes to phi. Uh, e power i alpha q phi it's a global symmetry let's just make it simpler because okay and so alpha is some parameter and then q is the charge of this under this u1 charge so so phi prime star is equal to e power minus alpha q phi star so you can write the lagrangian as l kinetic terms minus L potential okay which we call it as V okay let us express it write down these terms so L kinetic would be just the Klein Gordon part uh, del mu phi phi so, this is the global U1, uh, remember that it is a global U1 and LV phi which you call the potential would be the self interaction. So, this would be something like mu square phi dagger phi which is the mass term. Okay, Let me call it just <coughs> plus some lambda 
fire dagger file whole square this is also this is called the self interaction so typically for the klein gordon field we just write down this m square phi dagger phi term but there is also other term which is also invariant under the lagrangian under the u1 symmetry which is lambda phi dagger phi whole square which is allowed now uh, so now this m square plus phi dagger phi is called the potential and using this potential we can determine because uh, the kinetic terms so if the particle is roughly at rest say if it doesn't have enough energy we can neglect the kinetic terms okay so then the energy uh, the lowest energy state would be determined by only purely by its potential okay so the potential is essentially its mass times its interaction self interaction essentially okay you can neglect the kinetic part uh, because um, uh, if it doesn't have enough energy so it's almost like the zero nth energy okay if it doesn't have enough momentum so the momentum state is say, taken because the vacuum state essentially you take the momentum zero and then the lowest energy of this particular thing would determine what is the lowest energy state uh, the, the, of the potential would determine the lowest energy state so the potential if you plot this potential this potential uh, would look like so maybe just draw this axis in a better fashion so would look like something like this and this is some mexican hat sort of thing which is also okay which has a technical name which i leave here to understand so this is zero and its minima is not really at zero but uh, the minima is not at zero but the minima is at a point which is uh, when the field essentially this v of phi when phi is minus m square by lambda so minus m square by lambda at the square uh, square root this, when this is the value this is the value here essentially now so the minimum of the potential the potential is far from zero and e is at some phi zero value phi zero a value which is phi zero so it, the, uh, the the so that means the lowest energy state is not uh, zero essentially when the field takes the value zero the lowest energy state when the field takes some finite value that is the lowest energy state so at the vacuum what happens so if you expand the field expanding the field around the vacuum because you had always start with the, the lowest energy state say for example so we take uh, so phi is equal to oh, phi real plus i phi imaginary so let me give this uh, vacuum expectation value this is called the vacuum expectation value so this is phi phi zero it's called a vacuum expectation value so we expand the phi around its vacuum expectation value so this would be so phi around the vacuum expectation value would be so this i call it as phi zero or sometimes we just call it as a constant so let's just call it as a constant we just give it a non-zero value okay let me call this as some v okay so v to the real part so phi r is equal to real plus some field uh, excitation say for example uh, phi tilde okay and phi imaginary it's a like vacuum expectation value i just take it to be zero so phi imaginary i expand it to be zero plus phi imaginary itself okay okay now put these values 
put this back in the Lagrangian. So when you put this uh, expressions back into the Lagrangian and expand this Lagrangian, say for example the Lagrangian which we wrote down here, uh, this is equation uh, say 1 in our talk today. Okay. In this Lagrangian in equation 1, what you will see uh, the implications is to there are two implications the Lagrangian would have <coughs> a symmetric conserving part okay L phi r tilde phi r i which is invariant under the symmetry and then there is a part which is proportional to L v okay there is a part which is so let me call this as L 0 and this is L 1 essentially okay lv which also contains phi r tilde phi i okay and then there is a part which is consistent just purely of lv which we neglect we can it's a completely constant term we can neglect it so in the limit v goes to 0 v goes to 0, symmetry is restored. So that means this L0 is U1 symmetric. So the, okay this is a completely uh, so l2 is completely constant okay so so the uh, okay let me just repeat so we start uh, write the phi r to be v plus phi tilde phi i is equal to 0 plus phi uh, meaning the, the imaginary part i'll give it zero arcing expectation and the imaginary part to be just the expansion of that and when i do that i have three parts in the lagrangian the first part is essentially even symmetric in terms of phi real and phi imaginary there is no v in this and the second part contains a v term times phi tilde r i real and phi tilde imaginary parts of this expansion and the third part is completely dependent on v times some constants essentially some constants and that entire constant part can be neglected because uh, in the lagrangian it doesn't make sense to just add a lagrangian term a constant term because in the equations of motion that constant just goes away and then finally you have this uh, uh, so <coughs> so you only have uh, so and finally in l1 what i meant I mentioned was that in the lim in the limit l1 if in the lagrangian part l1 uh, if i just take v is equal to 0 uh, the symmetry is restored essentially this entire uh, L1 part just vanishes as in the symmetry breaking part just vanishes. So this uh, so V is remember is a dimension full term is a dimension full term that means it has mass dimensions. So if you remember V is m square uh, square root of m square by lambda lambda is constant term. So square root it has mass dimensions. So it is it only gives you these are mass, ter mass terms mass cube terms sort of these things essentially. A second consequence, a very important consequence in this uh, is the case that phi i is massless. It turns out when I expand, uh, put what is the definition of v into this particular case, you get phi i it remains as massless. Okay, if you input what is the definition of v okay and then do this thing it turns out that phi i is massless so you had two scenario uh, two important things that uh, the symmetry is broken in the l1 case which is proportional to a dimensional full quantity which is essentially uh, the v in this case so the dimension v essentially sets the scale of the symmetry breaking 
okay it's spontaneously broken and that is the vacuum expectation value that means it's the value of the vacuum okay and that is also the scale of the symmetry uh, breaking second thing it produces one of the uh, uh, there it generates a field to be massless essentially the total number of degrees of freedom are the same so to begin with initially we had two degrees of freedom and finally after symmetry breaking also you had two degrees of freedom but one of them ends up being massless and this a massless field is called a goldstone model so an important consequence of spontaneous breaking of continuous uh, symmetries produces something called goldstone bosons or essentially massless fields these are massless fields this statement is called goldstone theorem so this was proposed by goldstone okay uh, and then proven vigorously by goldstone Weinberg and Salam. So the Goldstone theorem proof is proven by these three others essentially in a one single a single paper. So this is called a Goldstone uh, by three different methods. They uh, all the three of them use three different methods and prove this theorem. Okay. <coughs> so so what you have. Uh, is that uh, uh, whenever there is a spontaneously symmetry breaking of a continuous symmetry you'll have some massless fields associated with this continuous symmetry and it is equivalent to the number of goldstone bosons and another consequence is bosons is equal to number of broken generators okay so the number of goldstone in the case of u1 what we have seen is that there is one broken generator and so you have one okay you uh, want to nothing you have one broken uh, generator and so you have one uh, goldstone boson now if su2 is broken say for example if you have su2 is broken if su2 is spontaneously broken one would have three goldstone bosons okay three goldstone bosons because su2 has three generators and so three goldstone bosons would be there so these three goldstone bosons could be essentially the massless fields of say <coughs> Uh, of the uh, say for example uh, of the which are the pions say for example if you have s 2 left a chiral symmetry breaking of s 2 r breaking to one single symmetry say for example some symmetry like this so the total generators here are 3 plus 3 and the total generators final are 3 okay initially you have a symmetry of s 2 l times left to r okay so there are six generators and then you have so three generators okay finally okay after symmetry breaking okay initially 
So initially means before symmetry breaking. Okay, SSB means uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. And after, this is after SSB, you will have three uh, generators which are valid. So the Lagrangian has only one symmetry which is SV2 symmetry. Then the number of generators which are broken uh, generators are three. And these can be three pions. Okay, this is the uh, basic idea that you can have. And of course, what do you do with the mass? Okay, so what do you do with the mass of the pions? So, uh, mass of the pions you add it explicitly later on, actually. So. So with the three pi ohms. This is essentially the basic idea of the Carroll uh, perturbation theory essentially with the three pi ohms. So the three pi ohms can be thought of as the Goldstone bosons of chiral symmetry breaking. Pi ohms can be thought of as so the Goldstone bosons of the chiral symmetry breaking. So this is the starting point of this uh, uh, entire chiral perturbation. Now it is a highly well developed theory which you can actually test with experiments and, uh, and do higher order calculations also. Uh, in uh, uh, so at one loop and uh, now there are techniques being developed at two loops actually okay <coughs> and uh, are the pions massless no they are not really actually massless they are massive so how do you give masses to the point you give give add rather than give actually add explicit symmetry breaking terms terms to give masses to the these are dimension full terms by the way these are dimension full terms to the pions say for example so what Nambu did was that he associated that uh, the pions to be um, are generated or these bond states are essentially uh, some uh, pa, the Goldstone bosons associated uh, with the a spontaneous symmetry breaking of some of the symmetry which could be SU2L times SU2R, a larger symmetry which is like SU2L times SU2R. The actual chiral symmetry uh, is uh, nowadays is essentially SU3L times SU3R and it's further much complicated actually. So there are uh, eight broken generators and so one has to worry about how to add them the corrections could be different because the strange quark mass is uh, heavy and so the corrections coming from the strange quark mass are much uh, uh, so it so especially with the k mesons and everything it could be slightly complicated actually to assess it but for the pion physics it really works very well the chiral perturbation theory and also for the k mesons people are trying to apply it and uh, improve it a little bit more and so on so so, so this is all about, uh, so I will stop here uh, up to uh, saying about chiral perturbation theory. So this is some theory where again you use the currents and uh, um, and associated, uh, uh, use the techniques of uh, Lorentz invariance and other field theory properties, okay, uh, to get information about uh, in the non-perturbity regime of the QCD. The other thing which is uh, uh, in a completely different fashion in, in terms of the first principles is called lattice gauge theory, which I mentioned earlier. So here, um, so the basic idea here is to discretize space time. And compute uh, expectation values on the computer. So uh, this was started by Wilson and I think 
he single-handedly developed most of the things how to put fermions and everything there is also Lucier who also did a lot of things and there is a lot of work on this thing uh, I, I wouldn't go into uh, complete details about this lattice gauge theory okay I wouldn't uh, say uh, more words about it but it essentially uh, uh, deals with putting uh, objects like fermions on a discrete fermions and gauge fields essentially starts with putting gauge fields on the lattice on discretized space time and there are two important things essentially it's the lattice size and the lattice spacing which determine how good your results are so the lattice spacing is essentially how the spacing is here between the various points on the lattice and also and what is the lattice size meaning how large this lattice size you take so so for a and in the limit the lattice spacing goes to zero so in this uh, it goes to zero it should give you the continuum results continuum means normal results essentially now the larger the lattice size this requires huge computing power so in our department we have prasad and before that we have apurva who are really big experts on lattice gauge theory and who are working on it prasad is actively moving, uh, work, still working on um, lattice gauge theories whereas apurva has moved on to quantum computing but it's a, he is also a very good expert on lattice gauge theories so prasad uh, okay so uh, if you are interested you can go and talk to him essentially to know more about these things now what uh, lattice does actually uh, uh, earlier it was not uh, taking time to because the computing power was uh, not so high and everything nowadays with the advent of gpus and uh, various other uh, cray machines and gpus and everything lattice computing has come up uh, really very good results lattice gives you currently the best results currently the best results to compute say for example uh, first generation uh, first two generation quark masses and several form factors so several form factors are computed on lattice actually these days and people use those uh, lattice results and uh, people use the lattice results uh, and uh, they are as, uh, uh, as close to the experiment as possible actually there are uh, uh, the best available results in the lattice is from here actually so uh, several form factors so gives so the most of the results okay um, if you look at pdg or any of the other things also quotes lattice results so though lattice is essentially a theoretical computation okay um, a lattice is a theoretical computation but still a theoretical computation uh, computation but is essentially it almost the results and everything are almost like an uh, you treat it as an experimented as an experiment because it's a front uh, uh, result okay it is treated as an experimental result because uh, you you do several simulations several thousands and millions of simulations it's like repeating the experiment uh, having several experimental results together so you actually treat it like an experimental result uh, 
so but it should remember because it's a simulation or a, a huge uh, meaning huge uh, uh, um, say if it's a simulation over huge space time essentially is elasticized size essentially with a very small spacing so it is uh, treated almost like an experimental result actually and it also they, they also present the results in that manner with small errors statistical errors and so on so it's Okay. So, uh, so these are the two main technologies which one uses uh, to compute, uh, say, non-perturbative uh, methods in uh, in for in the light quark essentially in the light quark regime. We will one can go further and further details, but I think it will be. Yeah, it's quite interesting actually, but this will uh, say take for more time. So we'll stop here, and uh, in the next lecture we'll talk about um, heavy quarks. What happens with the heavy quarks? Okay, um, or what are the mesons associated with them and stuff like that? And then we'll go to perturbative theory actually. Okay, so with this I think I'll stop this lecture. Okay.